and welcome back to our Bible study coming to you on behalf of Campbellsville Baptist Church. We're located at 420 North Central Avenue here in Campbellsville, Kentucky. And uh, we would like to invite you uh, to visit our church at any time. That's an open invitation. We'd love to get to meet you and get to know you and help you in your walk with the Lord or in any other way you might need some help or advice. Uh, our worship services are at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. Our Sunday school or connect group, uh, that uh, those meet at 9.15 a.m. prior to the morning worship service. And on Wednesday evenings, we have prayer meeting and Bible studies for uh, for you to uh, enjoy and uh, to, to take part in. And so we would like to, to invite you to, to visit our church. We would love to get to know you. Well, when last we met, we were uh, in 1 John, and we had looked at 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, through 1 John chapter 3, and verse 3. And uh, that, uh, that section of Scripture basically said that true Christians abide in Christ. In other words, they keep his word. Uh, they, uh, they, they keep uh, his, uh, his word. And so now we want to move on and, and recap just a little bit. We got a bit of a start on the next section here in 1 John chapter 3 and verses 4 through 10. And uh, the, the topic in this uh, passage is that true Christians, genuine Christians, they do not live in sin. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Indeed, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you that through your word, not only do we receive direction and guidance uh, as to what your will is, uh, for indeed your word contains your will, but Father, also we get to know more about you and, and your mind, though we can no leave, not fully know your mind in this life, and we get to learn more about your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we also get to know about how we should react with, uh, interact with one another as believers in Jesus, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that you'd guide our Bible study today. Thank you for salvation, which comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, as we mentioned uh, last time we met, uh, verses 4 through 10 here in 1 John chapter 3 are absolutely crucial crucial but frequently misunderstood because of the many unfortunate translations that are out there that are available. A, a cursory look at these verses makes it look like that uh, John was teaching that if you are a genuine Christian, if you have been born of God, then you don't sin anymore. So, that notion, though, of perfectionism, which we've already commented on uh, back in chapter chapter 1, uh, that notion of perfectionism that some hold to cannot be the case because of what John has said earlier uh, in, um, for instance, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, and also chapter 1 and verse 10. Remember, uh, if we say that we have not sinned, you know, we, you know, we deceive ourselves, and um, also, if, if we say that we've uh, never sinned, we make God a liar. Uh, those uh, verses. So, perfectionism cannot be what John has in mind. Um, if, you've born of, if you've been born of God, if you're a genuine Christian, the idea that you don't sin anymore is demonstrably false. Uh, so, the key to understanding this passage is really wrapped up in the verbs. It's uh, and particularly to to recognize the the present tenses of the verbs that that uh, uh, John uses with regard to sin and to uh, to righteousness. The person who is genuinely born of God does not live perpetually and habitually in sin. Uh, notice verse uh, six. No one who abides in him sins. I mean, now, at, at first look, that can make you think that, oh, no. And, and I had a problem with this early on in my Christian life. Well, you know, what do you mean? I, um, those who have been born of him, him uh, don't, uh, don't sin. Because I knew very well that I did sin. 
But I took advantage of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. But uh, no one who abides in him sins. Or in verse, um, verse 7, uh, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteous is righteous, just as he's righteous. But the one who practices sin is of the devil. And then verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin. Now, uh, this uh, the Bible I just read from, the New American Standard, actually does a pretty good job in those last uh, few verses. But uh, there are several translations out there that, that don't call to mind uh, they don't uh, emphasize the present tenses of the Greek verbs. And I think that's the key with regard to sin and righteousness. The person who's generally born of God does not live perpetually and habitually in sin. The one who does live perpetually and habitually uh, in sin is of the devil. We see in verse uh, 8 of uh, chapter 3, the one who practices sins of the devil, for the devil is sin from the beginning. And then also in verse 10, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So the, the, uh, the present tense verbs uh, in these uh, verses, you know, the, uh, the aspect of the present tense verb is, is one of uh, continuous action. And so uh, the idea of, uh, of persistently or con consistently or habitually, in other words, uh, those who practice sin uh, as a lifestyle. Uh, true Christians do not practice sin as a lifestyle. They don't live uh, in sin. Uh, those who do, who live perpetually, and habitually in sin, John says, are of the devil. There's no middle ground there. You're either of God or of the devil. Now, Christians do sin. We've seen this already in chapter 2, in verses 1 and 2, where John writes them and says, My little children, I am writing to you so that you do not sin. Uh, but if anyone does commit a sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one who is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So um, uh, he presumes that Christians will commit a sin, uh, although he would like the ideal to, to be the case, although it won't be the case uh, until we go to be with Jesus Christ. Uh, only then will sin stop in our lives. But we don't practice a lifestyle of sin. Why? Well, because the believer, a believer in Jesus Christ is a changed person. And just like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 uh, tells us, a believer cannot practice a lifestyle of sin because he's been born of God and God's seed, notice verse 9, verse 9, uh, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In other words, he cannot sin habitually, persistently. So a believer cannot practice a lifestyle of sin because he's been born of God and God's seed. In other words, something of the divine nature, perhaps a reference to the Holy Spirit with the word seed here, was implanted in the believer at the new birth. In other words, whenever he, he uh, underwent a conversion experience, whenever this person came to faith in Christ, whenever they were saved, at that point, something was implanted in him uh, at the new birth, according to verse 9, God's seed, born of God. So uh, there we have it. So, so the clear criterion in this passage identified the false teachers, these proto-gnostics, of John's day as infidels. We see this in verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. We see this in verse 6, which I've already read. No one who abides in him sins. No one who has seen sins has seen him or knows him. And also verse 10 again. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness 
is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So the clear criterion in this passage identified the false teachers of John's day as un infidels, as unbelievers, despite their Christian professions and associations. It does the same today. It does the same today for many professing Christians whose lives show no real ever evidence of regeneration, no real evidence that they've ever been saved. Now, there is such a thing as a carnal Christian. I mean, we know this from the Corinthian letter. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3 and verses 1 through 3 talk all about that. There is such a thing as a carnal Christian, a, a fleshly Christian, but there is no such thing as a perpetually, perpetually carnal Christian. In other words, sometimes I get asked, is there such a thing as a carnal Christian? And I would say, absolutely, there is, but you can't stay there. You can't stay there. There is no such thing as a perpetually carnal Christian. Now, verse 4 here in 1 John chapter 3 is, uh, is poorly translated in some versions in that it is interpreted by some to define sin as the transgression of the Mosaic law. And yet, the New Testament clearly teaches today that Christians are not under today, they're not under the, the Mosaic law. I mean, a quick look at Romans chapter 7 or verse 6. Galatians chapter 3, one of my favorite passages, verses 17 through Galatians chapter 4 and verse 7, indicate this, that Christians today are not under the Mosaic law. The statement in verse 4 of 1 John 3 should be trans translated this way. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. That is to say... Sin and lawlessness are interchangeable terms. So, in other words, lawlessness is a definition of sin. They're interchangeable terms. So you, you might ask, well, how do you know that? Well, because in the original language, both those words have the article in front of it with a, uh, with a verb of uh, being, the word is, and uh, so this indicates, this construction indicates that sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. Lawlessness is an attitude of rebellion against God and all that God has ordained. So it characterized the original sin of the devil. Did you notice that in verse uh, 8 of chapter 3, who sinned from the beginning? It characterized the original sin of the devil but it also characterized the original sin of man, of mankind, of humanity. If you look back at the, the fall in, in the garden there in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve who, uh, who sinned. And lawlessness, uh, rebellion, has characterized every sin since. Every act of disobedience to the revealed word of God is an act of open rebellion and a declaration of independence, in essence, from God. This rebellion is the very essence and nature of, uh, of sin. But Christ appeared. Christ appeared, and this is a reference to uh, Jesus' incarnation and all that he did while here on the earth, all that he did while in that state, Christ appeared to take away sins. Notice chapter 3, verse 5. You know that he appeared to take away sins. To take away sins. And you can also look at, uh, at um, again, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, where it says he's the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he satisfied... Um, God's wrath towards sin. He met the righteous demands of uh, God towards, towards sin. Not only that, not only did Christ appear to take away sins, but also, verse 8, to destroy the devil's works. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So uh, here we see two short reasons why 
uh, um, you know, what, why Christ came, why he appeared, why he was born in the flesh and came on the earth to take away sins. And he did that by virtue of his death on the cross and to destroy the devil's work. And then notice in verse 5, again, in 1 John 3, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him, that is in Jesus, there is no sin. So the fact that there is no sin in Jesus Christ gives efficacy to his redemptive work. In other words, what he did for us to redeem us from sin uh, is effective because he uh, he had no sin. There is no sin in Jesus Christ. And then John, as I have read, John summarizes this passage, particularly in verse 10, saying that the children of God and those of the devil are e easily distinguished. You can tell them apart. They're e easily distinguished. Anyone who does not practice righteousness as a lifestyle and who does not love his brother and sister in Christ is not of God. Chapter 3, verse 10 of 1 John. So this latter statement on loving fellow Christians also will, will mark a clear transition to, uh, to the next passage. Now, we've been talking about these things before. You know, uh, for instance, uh, loving one another, true Christians love one another. Um, you know, these three tests that I told you about uh, in the inter introduction to this course, they, they, they spiral down through the letter and appear at different places. He repeats them, which is okay, because re repetition's a good uh, teacher. But uh, here in verses 11 through 24 of chapter 3, here John will point out that true Christians love one another, while on the other hand, unbelievers hate and kill and so forth. So here we are now at uh, verse uh, 11. In this, the immediately preceding passage, the passage we just went over, chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, John established that a genuine Christian is an obedient Christian. In this passage, he emphasizes a specific area of obedience. And this, again, as I've already mentioned, returns to the subject of a Christian's love for fellow Christians as being a mark of genuineness. There was a, a theologian, he's uh, since gone to be with the Lord, by the name of uh, Francis Schaeffer. And he wrote a little book called The Mark of the Christian. And uh, it, it was a little book. You might even call it a booklet. You could read that book in one sitting. But it, it, he was spot on. The mark of a Christian is love. It's a mark of genuineness. Even Jesus, as we have cited, said, uh, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. We see that uh, there in uh, John 13, 34, and 35 through there. So it's a mark of genuine of genuineness for a believer that he loves his brother or sister in Christ. That believers should love one another, in essence, is an essential part. It's an essential part of the apostolic message which they have heard from the beginning. That's what John writes in verse 11 in chapter 3. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another another. Now the love uh, spoken of in this passage and the others that we see here in 1 John is agape love. Now we've all heard of agape love. Agape love refers to a volitional choice. You know, it's one we make with our wills uh, of our volition. It refers to a volitional choice to meet the deepest needs of another person, whether or not there's any reciprocation. Uh, it's an unconditional attitude, which is not necessarily related to pleasure, excitement, thrill, or ecstasy. That being the case, because it's not related to um, those uh, things, plus the fact that it's volitional, thus it can be commanded. It can be commanded. We can be commanded to love one another. Feelings, on the other hand, cannot be commanded. 
um, no one uh, can can make me um, uh, love the the New England Patriots. You know, <laughs> I'm talking about a football team now. Uh, you can't com command me to make that my favorite team or anything like that. Uh, you could, but uh, uh, you know, it's not like commanding somebody to love their brothers or sisters in Christ. So. Um, Agape love can be commanded because it's volitional and it's not necessarily related to pleasure, excitement, thrill, or ecstasy. And so it can be commanded. So this fact explains, then, how believers can love, in an agape sense, the unlovely. They may not feel any immediate emotional attraction. Indeed, in some cases, they may feel just the opposite. But they can will to meet their needs and to treat them as those for whom Christ died. In other words, as precious in his sight. And it is surprising that, we're, that a feeling of fondness and affection often develops also. But this aspect is not indigenous to the word. In other words, um, it's not... Uh, it's not it's not an aspect of uh, agape love this uh, feeling of fondness and affection even though sometimes a feeling of fondness um, often develops fondness and affection often develops notice in verse 12 that John uh, 1 John 3 in verse 12 John is going to present the murder of Abel by Cain as the classic opposite, the opposite of agape love. <clears throat> For this is the message, verse 11, which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother, killed his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So murder in this verse is the Greek word sfadzo, uh, which means to cut the throat. And uh, it probably describes the, the method uh, which Cain used to kill Abel. You know, uh, drawn from the, the method uh, used in making animal sacrifices. Cain killed his brother because Abel's deeds were righteous, while his own were evil. And John instructs his readers that the spirit of Cain was still quite active in the world. Righteousness provokes the world's hatred towards those who are righteous. Look at verse 13. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. So, um, the spirit of Cain is still quite active in the world. This, uh, what Cain did with the murder of Abel is the classic opposite of what it means to love somebody in an agape sense. Love for fellow Christians is proof that believers have indeed be, been saved. That is, they passed from death to life. And to the contrary, hatred towards believers is evidence that one is not saved. In other words, he still abides in death. Look at verse 14, 1 John 3. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love, namely his, his uh, the brethren, abides in death. So... Um, Love for one's brother and sister in Christ, for fellow believers, is crucial for the Christian. And then verse 15 enlarges upon uh, verse 14 of 1 John 3. Notice. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, just like uh, uh, Cain was, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So verse 15, like I say, enlarges upon verse 14. Anyone who hates fellow Christians is a murderer and does not have eternal life. Uh, someone may ask, well, um, then how 
might we know love? Well, John anticipated that question too. Look at uh, verse 16. Verse 16 says, we know love by this, and here it is, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So verse 16 provides the answer. Jesus is the pattern. He's the prototype for Christians to love others. He laid down his life for believers, and because he did so, because he did so, they also should lay down their lives in love for their fellow Christians. That's what we see here in verse 16. So, you know, agape love of this kind is more than an attitude. It really is. It's got to work itself out, though, in actual deeds. And as we, you know, if, if it's uh, authentic, uh, for instance, uh, Notice what it says in verses 17 and 18, 1 John 3. Now, he's just finishing uh, here talking about uh, loving um, the brethren and laying down our lives in love for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the uh, love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. So agape love is more than just an attitude. It's got to work itself out in actual deeds, if it is to be authentic. This reminds me of uh, that passage in the book of uh, James. In James uh, chapter 2, uh, in verses 15 and 16, yeah, here we have uh, these words on faith and works. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, you know, God bless you, um, and yet you don't give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And the answer to that question here in James is, uh, it's not of any use. Uh, matter of fact, James will use that in his argument for faith without works is, uh, is dead. So agape love's got to work itself out in actual deeds if it's, if it's to be authentic, if it's authentic. John says that genuine, unselfish acts of uh, this kind not only minister significantly to the needs of others, but the presence of such love in, a belie in believers' lives gives them assurance of their relationship with God. We see that in, um, in chapter 3, in verses uh, 19 through 24. The presence of such love in believers' lives gives them assurance of their relationship with God. Notice verse 19. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing uh, in his sight. So I think we're going to have to uh, stop there. We will come back again and pick up there with that uh, set of verses that I just uh, read. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it's, uh, I'm glad that you have uh, joined our Bible study today. I hope that this has been helpful for you as we go through uh, these uh, books and try to explain them in a uh, God-honoring uh, fashion. Before we close, why don't we have a word of uh, prayer? Father, it's absolutely crucial in our relationships with you to, to make sure that we are obedient. Lord, let us never be perpetually caught in sin, but rather... Anytime we sin, quickly confess it. We pray also, Father, that uh, we would make it a point to love believers, uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And let it not just be lip service, but rather help us, Father, as we seek to meet their needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, until next time, you take care and uh, God bless. Uh, take care now. Bye.